All right, what I'd like to do this evening is to uh, really speak to, I could say, the theme of the future of higher education, but to do so in a, not in a prescriptive way, but more in a kind of larger, a larger way, which really addresses the question of, I could say, what, what is this enterprise that we're actually doing? What is it all about? I'm going to do that by looking back a long way in order to go forward a long way. And then sort of midway through, we're going to finish with some of my opening remarks, maybe after 15 minutes or so. And I'd like to do a, an exercise with you, which I call a contemplative inquiry kind of exercise, where we're trying to exemplify in one small example, at least, what this process of knowing could be about in a way that includes and uh, not only knowing but the transformation and development of the full capacities that we all have available to us <coughs> but require attention in more ways in more ways than one and then we'll share a little bit and then have a closing um, and then we'll go share some cocktails or whatever, wine and cheese, and, and then we'll go listen to music. And uh, I really... <laughs> <laughs> want to thank those beings who are coordinating everything on the part of the universe for doing that, because it won't sound like that. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. No, this is really going to be a wonderful evening. Uh, Evan Chambers is going to be with us, as well as a voice artist, Tim Erickson and Susan Camino on the piano. And uh, Evan Chambers is a fiddle player and dulcimer player and composer at the University of Michigan, a person really of world-class stature. And so I'm anxious that you all come and bring people from the streets and anywhere you can find folks who really belong there this evening. Um, all right, let's start. When asked uh, what is evil, the Burmese leader and Nobel Prize winner, Aung San Suu Kyi, replied, I don't think there is such a thing as evil, but I think there is such a thing as ignorance. And the root of all evil is ignorance. That comes from an interview taken by Ivan Suvanja for Peace Jam, which brings young people, high school aged young people, together with 12 Nobel Peace Prize winners. This was before she got out from house arrest and was smuggled out of the country by very devious means by Ivan. But I love this picture, the picture that I don't think there is such a thing as evil, but I think there is such a thing as ignorance, and the root of all evil is ignorance. Now, Aung San Suu Kyi was, of course, thinking of the teachings of the Buddha. For example, in one of the discourses, we find the Buddha recalling, quote, before my awakening, when I was still an aspirant to be awakened, and not yet fully awakened as a person, it occurred to me, how troubled is this world? It might occur to us too. And people understand but little about the escape from suffering. When will an escape from this suffering be understood? The Buddha asked. And then having posed this question to himself, the Buddha then described how he entered into a state of what he called complete awareness, complete attentiveness, or samadhi. Complete attentiveness through which he came to penetrating insights, penetrating insights, prajna, and full comprehension. Then in his own words, I'll say, quote, because of my complete attentiveness to this matter, the matter of suffering, I came through penetrative insights to full comprehension. In this way, complete attention, complete attentiveness, 
led the Buddha to a chain of penetrating insights and from there to full comprehension concerning the source of suffering. Namely, that all human suffering is rooted in ignorance. What kind of ignorance did the Buddha have in mind? I mean, Google can solve a lot of our problems, but I don't think it solves this one. I know. What did he mean by this phrase, complete attention? What is not just insight, but penetrating insight and full comprehension? And what was the means of research or inquiry by which he came to his own insights and comprehension concerning ignorance and suffering? If we move from Asia, from India, we find our way to Athens. Around the same time, we find similar thoughts being articulated by, by Socrates, by Plato, Aristotle. There's a uh, aphorism that's often attributed to Plato, although I'm suspicious that it might not actually be his, but could be, which says, quote, ignorance, the root and stem of all evil. And in the laws of Plato, the Athenian states Quote, the greatest ignorance is when a man hates that which he nevertheless thinks to be good and noble and loves and embraces that which he knows to be unrighteous and evil. Which is to say that the greatest ignorance leads to the embrace of evil. So allow me to connect these thoughts to contemplation and to the future of higher education. For after all, education has as its high purpose the eradication of ignorance, which, according to these wise people, according to the Buddha and to Plato, just might lead to the eradication of evil and the end of suffering. This would not be a bad thing. So in this way, a true education, and then we have to try to understand what a true education is, a true education that addresses the whole human being reaches far beyond the conventional goods of learning, such as an informed citizenry or an effective workforce. Right. No, our very suffering is rooted in some kind of deep-set ignorance concerning ourselves and the true nature of the world around us, and that the cravings and attachments, they thrive on the delusions which in turn come from just this root cause of ignorance. So ignorance concerning ourselves and the world around us lead to fantasies, delusions, attachments and cravings are the consequence of that and the suffering that arises. So if we can, if we can dispel ignorance much is to be attained. So this is a remarkable prospect. And I think the Buddha and Plato, personally, I think they were right. Now, isn't that coincidental? <laughs> Amazing how this works. But we can examine even their, even their suggestions. So in that every other effort, it seems to me, at remediating the suffering of the world every other material attempt, is really a half measure. It really won't ultimately suffice. And so we're challenged to really look and penetrate to what kind of ignorance it is and what kind of knowing it is that will relieve that ignorance. Now I'm going to stick with this remarkable woman, Aung San Suu Kyi, because she also speaks in a, in a very interesting way about what she calls a kind of quintessential revolution. Now she has in mind democracy and social and governance issues in her own country in Burma. But translate them, if you will, to our situation, to our situation as educators. She writes, the quintessential revolution is that of the spirit 
born of an intellectual conviction of the need for change in those mental attitudes and values which shape the course of a nation's development. A revolution which aims merely at changing official policies and institutions with an eye to an improvement in material conditions has little chance of genuine success. Without a revolution of the spirit, the forces which produced the inequities of the old order would continue to be operative, posing a constant threat to the process of reform and regeneration. It is not enough merely to call for freedom, democracy, and human rights. There has to be a united determination to persevere in the struggle to make sacrifices in the name of enduring truths, to resist the corrupting influences of desire, ill will, ignorance, and fear. If I speak, you know, my own heart in this regard, the depth of change called for in higher education is comparable to that called for here by Aung San Suu Kyi. The quintessential revolution in higher education will likewise not be one that is concerned primarily with the, quote, improvement of material conditions. I mean, walk around the Amherst campus. We have every material support and benefit that the mind could basically imagine. And we are pleased that we can offer that to our students as well as to ourselves and to you. But we cannot rest content with changes there or in official policies or in institutional reform, even though these may at some level be of importance. As she says, unless we find a deeper, more comprehensive basis for change, what she calls a revolution of the spirit, the old order will reassert itself, constantly undermining whatever good we do. So what then is the revolution in spirit in higher education? I see this revolution in higher education as a revolution in what we take to be ignorance and knowing. What we take to be ignorance and knowing in our very epistemology, methodology, and concept of comprehension. We need these, these themes of full or complete attention, penetrative insight, and full comprehension that go somehow beyond what Google or even we as scholars can provide from our normal methodologies. We need to develop in the directions that these ancient thinkers, remarkable beings, suggested, it seems to me. You know, other colleagues and friends of ours have suggested likewise. For example, to echo the view of Parker Palmer, there seems to be today a kind of even violence in our conventional form of knowing and precisely here, it seems, is where we can stand and enact these steps towards the revolution spirit that Aung San Suu Kyi reminds us of. And in the paper that many of you know on love and knowledge, I argue for what I call an epistemology, an epistemology of love, in place of one that is an epistemology of distance, control, or manipulation. And that epistemology of love embodies and practices respect, respect before that which one would know, gentleness towards that which one would approach, an intimacy as opposed to distance, a willingness to be vulnerable, vulnerable to what it is that is offered to us from that which we encounter. And from that vulnerability then comes the possibility of participation, of participation in that which we would understand and the recognition that that participation will ultimately lead also to a kind of change or transformation of ourselves that results in the formation of new capacities or the awakening of those capacities which have lain long, long dormant in us. And then through those capacities there arises the possibility of perhaps what uh, 
the Buddha called penetrative insight, full comprehension. In other words, I'm advocating for a future form of higher education like that undertaken by Siddhartha or Socrates and other great figures throughout history who've committed their lives and their entire beings to that full, comprehensive, and deep understanding of self and world that can address the deep ignorance that is beyond simple absence of knowledge of concerning facts or, or straightforward ideas. And then suffering and evil, seems it seems they will fall away, it is said, when we have such an understanding. And that's achieved by the cessation of such a deep ignorance and the attainment of the full comprehension that is suggested. It seems to me that this is something towards which we, as a community, in some ways have uh, pledged ourselves. At least I can speak for myself that the kind of knowing which I've practiced over the years and decades, be it in physics or other technical areas, addresses a certain range of problems, a certain range of concerns. But that the deepest, that the deepest issues, it seems to me, require yet something more, something more that comes only at the hand of this form of engagement through respect and gentleness, intimacy, vulnerability, participation, change and transformation in us that leads to the formation of capacities, which are the capacities for insight and full comprehension. And so what's the pedagogy? You know, what's the pedagogy for the end of suffering? I mean, this is like, you know, <laughs> okay, we're going to do the end of suffering, you know? <laughs> but I think you have to actually reach out that direction. You have to reach somehow that far. It's all right. As long as it's not filled with pride and hubris, it has some modesty about it. Uh, you know, we're to look at the world as deeply as we can. So what is that pedagogy that we would practice that strives for the qualities of attentiveness, the qualities of attentiveness that will give rise in themselves to the penetrative insights and full comprehension that are adequate to dispelling the deepest kinds of ignorance. And even if we just take a little step in that direction. I think that when we take up the practice of contemplative pedagogy, the work that we're doing here, we're not just doing a little add-on I'm not just saying, okay, you know, do critical thinking, do that big and long, and then we, you know, give you a little relief by doing a little contemplative pedagogy. It seems to me that when we introduce this modality, we're trying to address that deep set ignorance. <coughs> and what I understand by the cultivation of complete attentiveness in the language of the Buddha seems to me to be this practice of the epistemology of love and all that that entails. Just that respect and gentleness and so forth leading to penetrative insight through the transformation of capacities and the opening of those capacities to the world. Remember Goethe's wonderful line, which for me is a kind of pedagogical line that I keep <coughs> reciting to myself in every audience I come to. So if you've heard it a thousand times, hear it again. You know, I came upon it when I was 22 years old. It's, you know. It's, it, it wears well. <laughs> you know, now say it in his language first. Jeder Gegenstand wohl beschaut, schließt ein neues Organ in uns auf. So every object, jeder Gegenstand, wohl beschaut, well contemplated, schließt ein neues Organ, opens a new organ in uns auf opens a new organ in ourselves, in us. Every object, just every object in the world, everything that's before you, every person, every natural phenomenon, your own mind, every object, well contemplated, holding it up to yourself, contemplating it well, opens a new organ in us. I mean, this is all about change and transformation. It's all about practice. It's all about contemplative engagement. And how can you hope to know 
except through such constant repetitive engagement, well contemplated. So the wisdom or full comprehension that arises as the fruit of contemplative pedagogy requires such a transformation. And it is not, it seems to me, a remote or abstract intellectual knowledge, but is a kind of direct form of beholding. That wonderful word theory, right, which has as its root to behold. So one learns to see through these new capacities, these new aspects of the world. We see the world more fully for the capacities that we grow, that we shape. And they are integral in the sense that they entail, it seems to me, also aesthetic and moral dimensions as well as conventional, more cognitive ones. We not only know, but we know through a kind of whole, a holistic beholding, which can then be peeled back and fragmented to a particular form or another, but it comes whole. And I think that this so-called spiritual revolution in higher education asks for nothing less from us than this kind of integrated form of knowing that is, to me, the fruit of contemplative pedagogy. I see no better way of really practicing this beholding knowing by contemplating well, that is to say, complete attentiveness, complete attentiveness developing those capacities for penetrative insight that leads then to full comprehension. This is also a way of knowing that, that draws us into the world. Sometimes it feels to people, I think, that the contemplative pulls us outside, pulls us away from the world. But if done properly, it does not distance us. Does not distance us. So that intimacy, that intimacy and gentleness is something which pulls us into the world, its sufferings, its unease, not distancing us through objectification or control. And nor is this a, a, a mystical state of bliss which connects us to the universal all and then paralyzes us and makes us ineffective for life. <laughs> right? Which you might worry about. No, I think that at the hand of this contemplative uh, pedagogy, education changes, certainly. But also think of medicine under the, under the force of contemplative engagement. Also, even agriculture. I would even say financial institutions. <laughs> the way we handle money would change with this kind of a knowing. Every aspect of life, I think, can be changed by the light of this contemplative engagement and insight. Indeed, I would say that all of the good things and creative uh, enterprises and dimensions of life flow from this source already, and that we're really trying to raise it this to consciousness, practice it more intentionally, and develop the means for that practice and honor it. So the revolution in spirit I'm suggesting is underway, I think, already in this room. That's my view. But we and our students are like, uh, you know, Siddhartha before enlightenment, before true freedom uh, is attained. We're like Plato before he met Socrates. You know, I love to think of them in their sacred groves or under the shade of a Bodhi tree or something of that kind, mm -hmm. teaching. And I always want to remember the class size that they had to deal with, you know. <laughs> it was really small. <laughs> So if you're a little discouraged about the pace of development in this field, remember, it was the class size at the beginning with Buddha was five people, or five ascetics. I don't think it was many more for Socrates. So it's taking place in this room, you know, and that those, uh, those ancient examples, they, they, they created for themselves a kind of pedagogy which I think embodies and can, you know, we can take as exemplifying the kind of friendship, the kind of love that existed within the community and for what it was that they were engaged in. Many of you will know a favorite story of mine is the, is the, is the story of Hephaestus, the god of craft, the ancient Greeks. And part of the reason I love that is, first of all, as a scientist, as an experimental physicist, I love the lab, I love the shop, I love making things. It may seem like I'm only a remote intellectual, but actually you know, having grown up under a car and fixing the carburetor and dropping the transmission. I know about those sorts of things. And so Hephaestus is my guy. 
Uh, and I especially like the fact that he's married to Aphrodite. <laughs> But it also, for me, is this wonderful symbol that you know the the force of love, which is in, which is exemplified or symbolized by Aphrodite, requires someone who knows how to work with fire, someone who knows how to work with the heat of the smithy and the forge, and then substance to put the substance into the fire, to stand close to the fire, to to live in the danger of that fire and at the same time know that that's what's required in order to reshape and craft the metal. And isn't our teaching and learning likewise, to stand close to the fire? The fire, you could say, that's also a kind of love, a love both of the subject that you're all gathered around, a love for, in some ways, each other at the classroom, so that something can flow between you that, that allows us to reshape ourselves and allows the student to engage at a level that also opens new capacities in them. Aren't they and we, like Hephaestus and Aphrodite, practicing together to create something really special and new, something beautiful, out of the metal which is our own nature, under the heat which is uh, our affection, our love for that which we're studying and for each other. Goethe at one point says, have you ever learned anything really from anyone you didn't love? No. So as I see it, the uh, spiritual revolution called for in higher education will bring this element, this force, which we could call love, into teaching and learning, not as a romantic sentiment, not as a kind of schwimmerei, but as the most profound form of knowing, where knowing and love come together. Through identification, where the object becomes the subject, this is something out of Barbara McClintock, the Nobel Prize winning biologist. And through the highest and most refined form of love, we are able to identify with and know from the inside that which we have only known from the outside, from without. You know, recall Emerson's essay, The Poet, in which, he, which we find the following. It says, this insight, which expresses itself by what is called imagination, is a very high sort of seeing which does not come by study, but by the intellect being where and what it sees, by sharing the path or circuit of things through forms, and by making them translucid to others. The path of things is silent. Will they suffer a speaker to go with them? A spy they will not suffer. A lover, a poet, is the transcendency of their own nature. Him they will suffer. The condition of true naming on the poet's part is his resigning himself to the divine aura which breathes through forms and accompanying that. So our work will take time, patience, persistence. To quote Aung San Suu Kyi again, she says, there has to be a united determination persevere in the struggle, to make sacrifices in the name of enduring truths, to resist the corrupting influences of desire, ill will, ignorance, and fear. It may take a while. But let us commit ourselves to this really, I think, high and noble task of the deep ignorance, the cessation and dispelling of that deep ignorance, not through the accumulation of inert facts or inert ideas as Alfred North Whitehead terms them, but by playing the poet's part, in Emerson's sense, by playing the poet's part, by, quote, being where and what we see, and thereby practicing true naming, which I take to be attained by complete attention, penetrative insight, and full comprehension, which is to say by an epistemology of love. Now, I'd like to... Uh, spend a few minutes with you doing a, inviting you into an exercise, a contemplative exercise. And I think, it's, uh, I think you'll see that it's concerned with our theme, our theme of what it means to be an educator, what it means to teach. So yes, put away your notebooks and iPads and whatever else you take notes on, and let's just uh, do the following. 
I'd like you to uh, remember something recently and from a classroom situation or if you're a counselor from a counseling situation or whatever your particular connection is to the academy, um, your own situation, if you're a student, a classroom situation, you not as a teacher but as a student, call to mind a, a kind of important or memorable occasion as clearly as you can. As clearly as you can. So bring it to mind. And practice what we heard about this morning, which is to say, no rumination. <laughs> so no analyzing, worrying about how you did in the classroom situation that you're now imagining. Where, did, you do, did you do well? Did you not do well? Simply allow it to be present before you as vividly as you can and as richly as you can. Notice the external situation. What kind of setting were you in? Who was present? Were they standing or sitting? All of the outer determinations, all of the outward dimensions of the uh, pedagogical situation, the teaching or learning situation that you were in. And then also check in with the feelings that you had, not judging them again, allowing them to be exactly what they were, And perhaps you can even sense the feelings of the others in the scene that you've pictured for yourself, whether it's one student in your office or a whole group of students in the class. So in a very phenomenological, descriptive way, just live fully into that situation. No judgment. <clears throat> and then maybe out of the multiplicity of uh, images that are before you, out of all that unfolded there before you, pick one particular moment where you felt the whole pedagogical situation came to a kind of came to a kind of head. Maybe the student was about to leave your office and they turned towards you and there was this mood of expectation. Or maybe in the classroom there was a difficult or challenging situation that came to a bit of a crisis. Whatever it might have been, just pick one moment that stands for all the others. One moment. Give it your complete attention. Then I'll suggest that you ask, what does it mean to teach or to learn? What does it mean to teach or to learn. And then I'd like to ask you to simply release the image, release the question, and enter into, as best you're able, an open, wide, silent awareness. without expectation, without knowing, simply presence. Come back to the image come back to the image that you started with, the single emblematic moment 
allow it to rise up once, once again, touch back, ask the question, what does it mean to teach, to learn? And then release once again. Let go. <clears throat> you can become still wider and more silent, more present. silence. Be awake to what comes. <coughs> not reaching, not grasping, just present for whatever arises. And then I'll invite you one last time. Come back to the image. Bring your complete attention to it. What does it mean to teach or to learn? Release. <coughs> let it go. And let it come. And now find a fit or honorable way to close. Is there gratitude? Practice gratitude. And as you close, is there something that you bring with you? A felt experience? out of the practice, perhaps even a small indication of a penetrative insight as to what it might mean to teach or to learn in such a moment as this. And then for just five minutes, I'm going to ask you to turn to a person beside you. And if you care to, speak a bit about what it is that might have arisen in the course of the practice concerning what it might mean to teach or to learn in a situation such as this. <clears throat> Thank you.
this is the real part of the whole conference, isn't it? You know, actually like turning to the person next to you and having a conversation. Um, so let's continue it over the rest of the conference and meals and dinner and what have you and breaks. Um, and I wish I could harvest everyone's thoughts or comments, uh, but we can't. <laughs> So I would like to suggest, though, uh, by way of closing, uh, that what we just did is in some ways, in some very small way, an occasion of contemplative inquiry. In other words, the mindfulness that we bring to the body, as we learned this morning, or the mindfulness we might bring to any sense object, can be brought to every occasion. For example, it can be brought even in memory to that pedagogical moment. And we can live not analytically and critically, but, but really phenomenologically with the reality of the experience itself. And which one of those prefrontal, medial, lateral things we're gonna <laughs> switch over to, we can't remember, but you know, it doesn't matter. Because <laughs> what we know is when we, when we stay in that non-judgmental presence and awareness, we're coming closer to something. A certain part of us settles. A certain richness arises. A kind of density and reality begins to animate us. We are intimate. We are respectful. We are gentle. We begin to participate that which we have inside of us as an image. And then we can, you could say, pose the question, whatever it might be that is important in that moment to pose, wordlessly even, that simply says, at the hand of this experience, for example, what does it mean to teach or for a student to learn in this moment? To hold it, I think it's like imprinting the experience with that, that enigma and then letting it go into the universe. Giving it out. I think of Einstein walking with his friend Michel Besso after a, you know, 10 years of holding on to a single question. 10 years from the time he was 16 to 26. And he turns to him and says, you know, I'm giving it up. He actually says this to him. He says, you know, I've been at this too long and I've reached a conflict which I simply cannot work through, the first postulate and second postulates of the theory of relativity, it turns out, speed of light being constant, inertial reference frames, laws of physics are the same in each frame. I give it up. They contradict one another. He goes another hundred yards down the walk, having given it completely up in a way. He goes, oh my god. <laughs> time. Time is the key. The relativity of simultaneity, which is an impossible thought to think if you're the first guy on the planet <laughs> to think it. Um, he had to give it away. You've got to give it away. You know, I don't know what's happening when it's gone, but... And then the unexpected, the not known, can arise. So the possibility of then coming to a penetrative insight that leads to a fuller comprehension that might one day also even dispel suffering and evil. And you know, this to me is first and foremost a kind of ethic that you have in the classroom. This kind of inner orientation and commitment. You know, every one of you, think of the ethics that underlie your pedagogy. the values that you bring to it. As you may struggle, it may not be easy, but think of those values. They're fundamental. And then on them is built this, uh, this kind of possibility for knowing, kind of epistemology that I've been articulating. A way of knowing which is meant to address you know, the, our deepest ethical longings for what this pedagogy could mean, which really is built around suffering. Right? Not just the suffering of this particular student, but of this whole planet. You know, isn't that really why, why we're educated? And then to have the consequence of that 
could shake our whole ontology, what we take to be reality. Right? That full comprehension could be so profound that it really does shape and change what we take to be the nature of the self, the nature of the world, which is actually what's required if we're to dispel ignorance and with it evil and suffering. Ethics, an enlarged epistemology adequate to rattling what it is we have and take as reality. So um, this is a little bit kind of st a stretch, but I think it's the stretch that I wanted to, uh, to speak to you tonight about this revolution. I think it is a revolution, right? And it is what she calls a spiritual revolution in the sense that it really is comprehensive, all-pervasive, transformative of our understandings of the ethics of our pedagogy, the ways of knowing that we, are, we have at hand that allow for complete attention, penetrative insight and full comprehension, and one that then shakes the very foundations of our conceptions of self and world in ways that do have that possibility, actually, actually, of dispelling ignorance at that deeper level, which entails all kinds of things. Namely, one might hope, at least to some extent, a deeper mitigation of suffering and evil. So this is a revolution in higher education, I hope, that takes us into the future. And uh, in you, and especially the younger people here, you guys, um, that's our future, right? The future that stands ready to hand. And to be in the presence of it when I'm here with you all is a special grace and privilege. Thank you very much.